Hi, Tony. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for being with us today. Good to meet you. Too. <laughs> um, you are one of the most celebrated and most decorated business leaders in Africa, and I would posit the world. So it's truly an honor to be able to host you at Stanford this afternoon. Thank you very much. We watched a video earlier um, where we learned a little bit about the foundation, which we'll speak about towards the later half of the interview. But we saw there that you're such a supporter and such an advocate of entrepreneurship, which isn't really a surprise because your parents were entrepreneurs. I'm curious to know how seeing them build businesses at a young age influenced you and impacted your journey. So I'm pleased and honored to be with you all today. Stanford, great university and um, a team from this great university visited the Tony Edmelo Foundation uh, before the pandemic, I think, and uh, I was quite uh, impressed. They were on time, in spite of the, <laughs> <laughs> in spite of the chaotic uh, traffic situation in, uh, in Lagos, and the research work also very, very impressive. So for me, coming back here, such an honor. Uh, have a great impression of your school. Entrepreneurship is, uh, is uh, in my DNA. I preach entrepreneurship. I encourage entrepreneurship. I also try to catalyze more entrepreneurs in Africa because in my own life journey, I've come to appreciate the significance and importance of entrepreneurship in transforming families, in transforming self, in transforming communities, in transforming communities, in transforming countries, societies, and humanity entirely. And when we founded the Tony Elmelu Foundation, it was driven by the need and urgency to help catalyze development in Africa at a scale that is sustainable, realizing further that entrepreneurship is the way to that. I was privileged, lucky, blessed to have been mentored in this journey of entrepreneurship, first by my parents, especially my mom who was an entrepreneur, small scale. <laughs> but uh, the lessons I imbibed, watching her, supporting her, continue to help me to date. And it's also critical in the message and advice I give to young entrepreneurs. I learned from her about hard work. She was extremely, extremely hardworking at the time. To date, she just turned 94, and she's still very hardworking. She will cook for me when I call that. I said, uh, send your driver to come and pick food. And I'm like, mom, I have so many people to cook for me. But that spirit in her remains ever so strong. She was disciplined. And I've come to realize that this journey of entrepreneurship Discipline, fact, not just entrepreneurship, everything in life, discipline is critical for success. She was extremely tenacious. And I've come to see, and I preach this too, that the journey of entrepreneurship is not a linear journey. It's up and down. But if you're tenacious, if you're resilient, you cross the finishing line. So those are part of the early learnings from my parents, my mom, my dad, long ago told us. And the reason is, it's in my brain to date, that if you earn a dollar and you're unable to save, if you earn a billion dollars, you will not save anything. So that, for me, is the first lesson in capital formation. Capital formation starts from savings. If you do not save, you don't have money to invest. If you don't invest, you remain where you are. And so these lessons have helped me in this journey of entrepreneurship. So let's fast forward a few years 
you graduate um, from university with a, master, a bachelor's and a master's degree in economics. You then proceed to become one of the youngest bank branch managers <laughs> in Nigeria, typically a job reserved for people who are in their 50s or 60s. You become the managing director of one of the most, one of the biggest banks in Nigeria. And then 2005 comes around and you are being asked to help lead what becomes like the biggest merger in Nigeria's corporate history. What were some of the challenges that you faced during that time and which leadership principles did you stay rooted in as you were guiding this process? At the time, uh, quite a lot of challenges, <laughs> but uh, just to contextualize so I understand it, we took over a distressed bank called Sanda Trust Bank in 1997. And in 2005, we merged Standard Trust Bank and United Bank for Africa. But before the merger, there was an acquisition. Standard Trust acquiring significant interest in United Bank for Africa. Then we merged, and I emerged as CEO. So first, you saw United Bank for Africa as almost 70 years old as an institution, and uh, kicked and set ways of doing things. Then digital adoption was not uh, so strong. And so at times it took people months to read mails, emails. <laughs> and uh, you, in terms of service delivery, those days the old generation banks were not so strong on service delivery. And we were coming from a bank that was so strong in service delivery and technology, young people, etc. So a bank with size of uh, less than 1,800 people, and the United Bank of Africa had about 12,000 staff. These 1,800 younger, technologically advanced, and this other one <laughs> older, and very big bank. So it was not easy integrating, no? because as you see, corporate majors, the legal combination is not the issue. The difficult part is the people integration, the culture integration. That is the tough part. And so, and if you can see from history, most corporate institutions, it takes so many years to integrate people and culture. And if you do not integrate people and culture properly, you lose the major value levers. And so we were mindful of this and wanted to make sure we were able to merge, integrate. And this is a financial institution that was like, you merge, they want customers, don't care whether they want to be served. Same institution, they moved on. So it's a tough integrating our people, merging our people, merging cultures, old culture state, uh, set in their ways, and a vibrant younger culture. But therein lies the interesting aspect of the combination of the job. I say to people, my elder brother, who is uh, seven years older than me, he doesn't have gray hair. I have gray hair. My gray hair started from the company major <laughs> because uh, <laughs> making it work, serving your customers, making sure that everyone in the universe of the institution, which was uh, we had 428 branches at the time, that uh, it was the same level of service across board. Customers of standard trust bank that were used to a certain level of service delivery, you would not want them to come to the new institution and have a drop. So we just had to make sure that service would put our customers first. And that's why today, United Bank of Africa, which interestingly has grown mm -hmm. from a one country bank to a bank that operates in 20 African countries, with presence also in, in, in Paris, London, recently Dubai, and the only African bank that operates in the US with a, as a deposit taking institution. It started small, it's grown that big, and that experience during the merger continued to guide what we do, especially how we prioritize our customers, and how to prioritize our people. So I would say the biggest lesson from that combination was making our people, integrating our people and culture, uh, was realizing that, especially in the service sector, where you sell intangible, so to speak, 
it is a very important that your core army, your workforce, that they are fully aligned, totally integrated, and positively mobilized and motivated. If you lack this, you can make progress. And those lessons from the early days, you know, resilience, hard work, discipline, staying focused, prioritizing people, have all helped us in creating today's United Bank for Africa. And as you mentioned, you all were able to do that very successfully. You expanded from being a single country bank to one that operates in more than in 20 countries in Africa and then has um, an impact and influence and reach in other countries as well. Many of us are interested in working in emerging markets or are building, developing products or services for emerging markets or one emerging market to begin with. And I'm curious to know, how do you evaluate which markets to enter when you are expanding United Bank of Africa? And, um, and when do you determine, how do you determine what's the right, when's the right time to do so? <laughs> so first is, uh, most time people see the empty part of a glass. At times people will see also the full part of the glass. You would always have difficulties and challenges in every, almost every sector, especially countries you want to go into. So when we decided to expand into Africa, uh, the story was first, we thought that um, we had a master the art of Seven customers, because that's what banking is about. Banking is about uh, saving your customers. It's all about customers, customers, customers. And realizing that to save your customers, you must have a mobilized workforce that's aligned with those mission and uh, vision that you see for the, for the group. So we felt, looking at the African landscape, that we had opportunities. We thought Nigeria was the, remains the largest economy in Africa. And we thought that um, the level of banking or service, uh, service support was very high and that we should leverage this and spread across the continent. And we had to decide which country should we go to, how do we decide a country, macroeconomic stability, policies, et cetera foreign exchange policies, you know, ease of doing business in countries, taxation policies in countries, and the demography of countries, because we were quite upset that we would so like to support small and medium scale enterprises. You know, that is the bedrock of United Bank for Africa. And uh, so based on that, we came up with uh, 30 countries that met the internal criteria we set up. We called it the, the UBA, we developed what we called the UBA Red Book, how we wanted to expand Africa, issue to consider, etc. But in all of those issues, the ease of doing business in countries was very critical. Uh, we, the population was also important. The GDP of countries, income per capita was important. Ease of finding the right uh, human capital to work with because, again, you know, it's a people business. So that was very important to us. And we came up with all of this. We now tiered it. We have what we call it, what we develop what we call the three-tier strategic intent. Tier one was wanted to be strong in Nigeria. Tier two, be a leading Pan-African bank. And tier three, being a global, having present global financial centers, which is why we talk of London, Paris, New York, Dubai. It's all part of our three-tier strategic intent. The second one, therefore, was orchestrating our expansion in Africa. And on that was, what strategy do we do, a country strategy or not? You know, pass through or have presence in countries. And we decided that we needed to have presence in countries. And next was, okay, how do you, the countries, let's tier the countries. Again, we use GDP as well in tiering the countries, and we started rolling out. Greenfield, Brownfield, acquisition, measures, how do you want to grow? We decided that uh, we do a combination of both. So in the countries we went to, some countries were acquired banks, some were merged, and some we started green, Greenfield. And the journey is so far so good today, United Bank for Africa serves over 35 million customers in Africa. 
and still growing. We're helping to simplify payments on the continent. We're helping to orchestrate trade transactions, intra-Africa trade transactions. Prior to this time, Africa did not trade with and amongst itself. Or we, we believe the reason Africa didn't do this is well, because of payment issues, because of uh, even infrastructure, even transportation infrastructure, and also making sure we support and capacize small, medium scale enterprises to grow. So UBA has, has done quite a bit in this uh, space. And most importantly, financial inclusion, We're trying to make sure that everyone a continent with over 1 billion people, the banking population is not so high. So to us, it's not just about banking or self offering banking services, it's about what we call democratization of access to financial services. It's about financial inclusion. So I'm making sure that almost everyone in markets where we operate have access to banking facilities. And that's a banking services. And that's why in some countries, was spearheaded and pioneered opening of bank account zero balances. Because what's important to us is to be able to attract people. We believe that in Africa we have informal economy that is very large. And all of us should be involved in trying to formalize the informal economy. And this is one of the ways we're doing so through our banking services. In other areas of our operation and as a group, we're trying, we try to do the same thing. What we do at the Tony El Melu Foundation is all again about helping to develop the continent, financial empowerment, taking opportunities to people irrespective of your cadre, irrespective of your level in the society, irrespective of where you live, whether you live in urban or rural areas. So those are things we need to keep doing to create a more inclusive society, especially in Africa. You, you alluded to this a little bit earlier. There's a lot of in innovation happening in the financial services industry, a lot of tech disruptors, and all um, many of which are working towards that goal of democratizing access to financial services. What, like from your position as CEO and now chairman of United Bank of Africa, what do you, how do you see the company collaborating or, or even competing with some of these disruptors? particularly thinking about new technologies like cryptocurrencies, peer-to-peer -peer payments, et cetera? First is, um, I was CEO of UBA, the Chief Executive Officer of United Bank of Africa, about 12 years ago. <laughs> so today, I don't see myself as a banker per se. Mm -hmm. I'm an investor that plays, invests in banking, in helping to improve access to electricity on the continent, in a critical resource uh, deficit on the continent that's important to bridge if we must job frog, leapfrog and uh, move the, the continent to where it should be. We investors in healthcare sector who have realized that uh, indeed health is wealth. If uh, the pandemic taught us one thing, it is about prioritizing health and realizing that uh, what the war couldn't do, health or lack of it can do it. Who would have thought that the entire world would go into a lockdown mode? I, I never thought that could happen in my lifetime. So we're investing in that sector. We're investing in energy, you know, the, the full energy chain, because again, for a continent like Africa, it's critical for us for, for growth. So, for us, or for me, at this point, I'm not so much of a bank. However, uh, as a group, we realize the importance of technology. That, you know, the digital disruption that we see in the world is real. And in Africa in particular, thanks to the, the population of our continent, we know that we have to catch up. If we don't catch up, we're going to be left behind. And for businesses and business we are associated with, like United Bank of Africa and other businesses, digital adoption is critical for our service delivery, for everything that we do. So in the payment space, we lead in the payment space through digitization, through adoption, with partnership with fintechs and all kinds, just to make sure that we're able to serve our customers. Today's customers 
they don't need a bank. They just need a facilitator for payments. You know, they need a facilitator that follows their lifestyle. So, and banking is changing. It's changing from the way we used to know banking so many years ago. So they, you can sit in your heart. In fact, I tell you, at United Bank of Africa, I told you earlier that we have 35 million customers. A few years ago, no, 2005, when we did the major between Standard Trust and United Bank of Africa, all of 2004, UBA celebrated was the first bank in Nigeria to have 32 ATMs. 32 ATMs in all, of, in all of Nigeria, in all of Nigeria. And it was a major marketing tool that we have 32 ATMs. And then uh, the first bank also to pay out 1 billion naira, our local currency, billion naira, in cash. Then let's just say 100 dollars, 100 naira per dollar in cash today. And then, then, 97% of our customer transactions occurred in the banking hall. Today, UBA opens about 500,000 accounts every month. And these accounts, these accounts, 95% are opened online, not in the banking hall. <laughs> Number two, transaction count. We have over 98% of our customer transactions now occurring online, not in banking hall. Okay. In terms of ATMs, UBA alone, just UBA alone, has close of 4,000 ATMs in Nigeria, all from 32 up, ATMs. Yeah. All from 32, <laughs> <Big jump. laughs> 32 And of course, POS is uncountable. There were no POS before. So things have changed. And by the way, we change further. The, it totally, I mean, just, uh, technology is disrupting a lot of things, not just in the U.S., not just in the West, but everywhere. Everywhere. Even healthcare, in our healthcare sector, today, healthcare can be delivered digitally, online, and everything. So we, we, we live in a very in a new world, and every one of us is uh, adopting and adapting fast to, to the new world, or will be left behind. You mentioned energy a little earlier, which makes me nervous because it seems as though you're reading my mind because that's where I want to go next. <laughs> um, last year, the Africa Energy Chamber recognized you as one of the 25 most influential individuals in shaping Africa's energy sector. I'm curious to know, especially knowing that at Stanford, sustainability and energy renew and renewable energy and energy more broadly is a really important subject that gets studied here and talked about a lot. Um, what are the most pressing issues and solutions being discussed right now as it relates to energy in Africa? And also, I would love to know a little bit more about the work that you're doing, I think, I believe, through Transcore uh, to address this. Correct. So access to electricity is extremely poor in Africa. Less than 35% of our people have access to reliable electricity on the continent. This is a continent of young people. Over 700 million people are young on the continent, under the age of 30. And yet access to electricity is almost impossible. These young ones are in a very competitive world. They are going to compete with children who are used to 24-7 uninterrupted electricity supply. So the world we see ahead is actually frightening because uh, the divide we want to bridge is not the case happening in the digital space. It's not happening because of access, lack of access to reliable sort of energy on the continent. And from the work we do at the Tony El Melu Foundation, from our close interaction with young Africans, male, female, we know, we can tell, we see, we hear, listen to them, that access to electricity is a major hindrance, constraint on their ability to succeed. This is why most, I'm sure you, Stanford, you must have seen this in your business uh, research studies, that most small and medium scale enterprises on the continent die. They don't succeed. 
and single most important factor for this due to poor access to electricity. So to us as a group, we believe in the concept and philosophy of African capitalism, which is uh, a call on the private sector to play some role in developing our continent. It's a, a realization that the private sector has a role to play in developing the continent. And in practicalizing this, and not just speaking to it, we decided that the power sector was critical for us to invest in. And so we mobilized resources and invested in this space. Today, we have capacity to generate about 2,000 megawatts of electricity but we have some other hindrances like gas supply and grid connectivity. So we're able to generate about 700 megawatts out of the capacity of 2,000. But we're happy that we're playing a key role in this area. But my message always has been to investors We've, start, we've been on this trip, we started from Washington, we've been to New York, we attracted a lot of investors in New York. When uh, LA, we attended the Making Institute, which had a gathering of uh, global asset managers and fund managers. And message, my message has been consistent. We have opportunities in Africa, there's huge opportunity in Africa, huge population. Our income per capita has improved, it's improving. And we lack access to electricity on the continent. So as the world mobilizes towards a more inclusive society, as the world mobilizes through to a more prosperous world, I always like to remind people that we cannot have that prosperity across the world if we not deal with the issue of access to electricity on the African continent. The reason we have youth unemployment in Africa is attributable to this. The reason we have youth restiveness in Africa is attributable to this. The reason some embrace extremism is attributable to this. In fact, government's ability to cover and fight extremism is also limited by this. So at times you see communities and large spaces that do not feel any impact of government or society because there's no access to electricity. So it's a major, for me, it's not just an investment, you know, a commercial investment. It's, um, it's what we should be doing in the 21st century to help improve access to electricity. And yeah, I can never shout or say it enough. And I want to have more people in this in this crusade that all of us those who have capital should look at investing in africa there are opportunities there and those who have voices let's keep shouting to attract attention <laughs> or those who have deep pockets so that collectively all of us can make a difference in the africa i want to stay a little bit i want to spend some time on what you mentioned earlier Africa capitalism which you are known across Nigeria and other countries as well, have been a strong proponent of, and you've detailed here. I'm curious to know why you believe that Africa needs to take a unique approach to capitalism. Well, it's not a unique approach to capitalism, per se. It's, for me, a realization. Okay, so at times, you there's this... Uh, entitlement mentality that people have, okay? We should be helped, we should be supported, we should be developed. <laughs> but for Christ's sake, you know, I mean, it can't be like that forever. We need to help ourselves too. So it's a realization that comes. The private sector has also grown, is growing. We need government to prioritize, we need government to create the right environment for private sector to keep doing well. But the private sector also must be sensible and reasonable and conscientious in how we do things, okay? We, we should invest in a manner that helps to catalyze prosperity. We should invest in a manner that helps 
to, to create social equity, social wealth. We should invest in a manner that helps to create inclusiveness. So this is not just about a new form of capitalism or the other. It's more about how the fact that the private sector should play a role in helping to develop the economy. And let's stop blaming others for our woes. Let's stop blaming others for everything. Let's lead and hopefully they follow. And I've seen it happen. You know, some of the investments we have made, we did not invest all the capital assets. We reached out. And we see that the world we live in is becoming highly interdependent. And people are also beginning to listen, especially if you show a good example. Okay. So it's a call on all of us, private sector, whether in Africa, outside the world, that we'll have a role to play. In advanced society, again, the meeting I attended in LA, it all has different names today. You know, um, patient capital, impact investing, um, shared prosperity, mutual destiny. We just need to invest in a manner that's not just about profits for the investors. We should invest in a manner that creates mutual benefits for everyone, for the investors, for communities where you do business in, for society at large. The fact that we do what we do at the Tony Melu Foundation, committing hundred million US dollars to supporting the next generation of African entrepreneurs, it's not because we have so much money. But we also know that some of the basic needs we want to have are provided. So it's not about what we have in the bank account. It's about that thing that's in the bank account, how can we take a part of it and share? Not for me, not even sharing in a manner that creates a dependency, perpetual dependency, no. In a manner that makes you stand on your own, makes you self-reliant. And so when we say we'll give non-refundable seed capital of $5,000, and when we do so, and to date over 16,000 Africans have benefited from that program, it is not to encourage laziness, no. But we know when San Francisco, where in tech uh, environment, we know some started with less than $5,000, but today they've grown big. So we just want to give young Africans access, opportunity, opportunity to prove their concept, and then let others see them as good and come and invest in them. So we need all the private sector playing a role. We need everyone. We need private sector looking at critical sectors. Today, we talked, I just spoke about electricity. Instead of people keeping their monies in bank accounts abroad, why don't you bring your money to invest in the electric sector on the continent? You make more money, but you also impact society in a more positive way. That is the, the entire essence of it. It's so we, we need more private sector leaders showing the way. But we need also our public sector leaders creating the right environment that will enable the private sector to do. And we need Friends of Africa development partners to also begin to look at how, how they intervene, how they engage, and how they give in the 21st century with the aim to create self-reliance and independence rather than perpetuating uh, this syndrome of uh, dependency. Now, Tony, typically when people retire from very high stress jobs, such as being the CEO, <laughs> one of the largest banks in Africa, they take a vacation. Um, you instead decided to found a company, Heirs Holding, and also the foundation that you've alluded to. I'm curious, this was back, this was a few years ago, I'm curious about what you saw happening like in Nigeria or beyond that at that time that drove, that was the impetus for you to develop this foundation. We did two things. When I retired in 2010, 12 years ago, we decided to create a family office, which was to some extent novel in our part of the world. And we said the family office will be quite catalytic in the kind of investment that we make. Hence, this philosophy of African capitalism. So, as audience is uh, epitome and this home of our overall group philo investment philosophy of African capitalism, 
and decided the sectors that we consider very important that could help to move the needle, power. We Nigeria and Africa is endowed with a lot of resources, yet we do not have the ability to process all of this and convert them to the state that they can become valuable to our people. So we said energy from an integrated point of view and across the value chains. We looked at healthcare sector and we said health is important that we need to invest in the healthcare sector. So these were the key, of course, real estate was important in Africa and hospitality. Okay? Hospitality, if you want to grow a country, an economy, transportation and, to, and hospitality, critical for, for, for this. So those were the things we decided to, to, to do at the time. The motivation was to help drive our philosophy of capitalism further, but equally important to help manage the investments. And we wanted to push on as audience as they go to investment partners on the continent. We wanted to help to attract investment to the continent. And so far, so good on that. And the other, the other thing we did, the second thing was the foundation. I thought that um, my story has been one of um, this element of luck in my story. <laughs> this element of being at the right place at the right time. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I wasn't the most intelligent in my class, you know, and uh, also uh, I wasn't the most hardworking, you know, of my set and people I knew. And therefore, there must be luck in it that I'm who I am, what I became. And I thought, um, you know, I had risen very rapidly, done quite a lot. And I thought it was time to commit this second phase of my life to helping to impart humanity, to helping to, to, to democratize that luck that I had growing up, to help uh, expand access to opportunities, to help people. I mean, I you spoke about parents. I said entrepreneur, but small scale entrepreneur, not <laughs> the kind of big entrepreneur you see. And so I was not like a son of any known, um, known, uh, known uh, families, so to speak, just regular family person. And so, you know, and I've been in, inspired by what I see around the world. You know, you look at Steve Jobs, for instance, you know, and his background. And I ask myself, Steve Jobs were an African. If he was an African in Nigeria, would he have been able to succeed? At the scale and magnitude that he succeeded. I mean, long after his death, you know, a company is funded first to cross one trillion in market cap. And just recently, you know, what doing. so it's all of this that drove me to say, you know, it will be an unfortunate, uh, I don't know what I will say to God if I do not create or help to create more Tanyeli Melis on the continent of Africa in the first instance. And that was what drove, drove um, my wife and I at the time to decide that. Um, we should commit 100 million US dollars to helping to identify, support, and empower the next generation of African leaders, and to do it at the scale and magnitude that's never been done before. Um, given that we do business in many African countries, we decided it should not just be about Nigeria, it should be about Africa. Given that uh, we know that poverty anywhere is a threat to all of us everywhere, we decided to make sure that it's broader. And so that is why we started the Tony El Melo Foundation. So the motivation for starting the Tony El Melo Foundation is to help democratize luck, create access to people. Whether or not you are a big man child or a poor man child, you have ideas, you're enthusiastic, you're committed, you're ambitious, apply. And it's sector agnostic. 
I will give you opportunity. And so when I look back today, I see that as a major, a major achievement, what we have done. The happiness I see on the faces of these young Africans um, gives me good. So my final question for you, you seem to be a nation in and of yourself. Through the foundation, you've worked with local governments, international governing bodies um, to help move capital where it's most needed. And so I'm sure you've heard it asked many times before, Nigeria is now in its election season. I will join the chorus. Why aren't you running for president? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. When she was asking me when she was coming. I think uh, first is... Um, When I look around, I know the potential that we have as a continent and as a people. I see opportunities. I know that um, life can be a lot better for people. And oftentimes you feel the urge to to, to show interest in how we are governed and how things happen. But I soon also realized that because I've never been selfish, because I've never been self-centered, because it's never been to me that it must be Tony, I say to myself, if there are other good people, capable people, who are in the race, who are showing interest, why don't you support them and share with them what you think should be the right thing in terms of leadership, in terms of governance in the 21st century Africa where our people have suffered and continue to suffer so much. You know, I realize also that all of us cannot be in the political space. But I know well that evil succeeds or tries in the world when good people keep quiet. So I say to myself, just the way I'm committed to entrepreneurship, the way I'm committed to helping to empower young Africans, we should support emergence and the orchestration of good governance across the continent. Because I think that is what has held us down as Africans. So for me, it's not just about Nigeria. It's about many countries, many countries on the continent. So I am interested in good governance. And I know that what we preach and advocacy and everything we do, trying to encourage young people, would not succeed if the political space or the leadership is not good. So mine is for to continue to encourage the evolution of the political process that we won through our good leadership and two, ensure that our leaders stay accountable. Um, that process is not there yet, but we are working together. And I, again, it's one area when I was in Washington, I said to political leadership here too, that it should be a concerted effort. It should encourage people on the continent to do what is right, even as we also from the continent continue to speak and have on good governance and accountability. Thank you so much, Tony. That was amazing. And typically, we like to close with a lightning round of questions. So I have four for you, and sure. I'm going to say them, and you have to answer as quickly as possible, hence the lightning part. Okay. Um, so outside of, aside from Palo Alto, California, what's your favorite place to visit? I didn't hear that, sorry. What's your favorite place to travel to? Oh, outside. <laughs> 
I just came from LA, Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. More than San Francisco. No, no, you didn't say more than. You said, <laughs> you said aside from. You said aside from. <laughs> you didn't say more than. Um, now with Nigeria out of the World Cup, who are you rooting for? Wow. Mm. <laughs> Even my, my boys, were, they were like crying when they dropped. I think, uh, I think Nigeria is Senegal. Okay. Senegal. Safe choice. Senegal. Um, what's ah, who's who's one Senegal here? What is your favorite Wizkid song? Hit song. Which? What's your favorite Wizkid? Wizkid song. Oh, <laughs> Lemba. You don't know that. I don't know it. Can you? Can you show us? Can you tell us how it goes? Who has an iPhone here? You want me to, you want me to no, play Ojo Lemba on my phone? <laughs> Um, and last question, what are you most grateful for? Oh. I'm grateful to God for my wife and family and children. I think, uh, you know, you can't do well in life if you don't have a home that's at peace. I do have a very peaceful home, and my children are reinforcing too. So I'm grateful to God for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.